This seminar is for educational purposes only. It is not a substitute for professional medical advice or treatment. Consult with your medical provider for medical advice or treatment. Although the presenters try to keep the information in this seminar as accurate and timely as possible, the speakers and Mather Hospital assume no duty to ensure the seminar is error-free. The speakers and Mather Hospital are not responsible or liable for any claim, loss, or damage resulting from you viewing this seminar. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening for our knee and hip replacement webinar. Please enter any questions you may have using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. We will answer as many questions as we can within the time allotted toward the end of the presentation. Our first presenter is Dr. Michael Frackia, Director of Orthopedics and Mather Hospital and a partner in Long Island Bone and Joint, part of the Orlin and Cone Group. Dr. Frackia. Uh, thank you, Stu. Thank you all for, uh, for joining us uh, tonight. Dr. Savino and myself, we've done this uh, seminar uh, dozens and dozens of times. Um, and we, uh, we really want it to be educational. We believe that if you understand what's going on and what your options are, the patients will always make the, uh, the right decision. So we go to the next slide. <clears throat> so uh, what we're gonna talk about today is what is a joint replacement, um, how it's done, who is it for? We'll talk a little bit about the risk. We'll talk about rehabilitation, physical therapy. We'll talk a little bit about money We'll talk about outcomes, what you expect to get out of all of this, and then we'll have plenty of time for question and answers, which is really the best part. Um, so Mather for uh, 15 years has uh, received an A rating for patient safety, and they're pretty proud of that. And I attribute that to all of the staff at Mather, uh, especially the nurses, you know, for really getting us that rating. So what are the goals? The goals are to reduce pain, to get rid of any assistive devices, if you're using a walker or a cane or anything like that, we would like to get rid of that. We want to improve your motion. Ultimately, we want to improve your function. And we'd like to get you back to the things that you want to do, whether that's uh, golf or tennis or um, maybe even skiing or some of the things that you want to do. It may just be walking from one end of the mall to the other, but that's certainly a goal. So before we talk about surgery, we'll talk a little bit about not surgery, okay? So obviously you can lose weight. And I always tease people I lose about 400 pounds a year. Um, you can use an assisted device like a cane or a walker. You can uh, take a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agent like Motrin or Aleve or some of those. You could take an actual steroid like prednisone or Medrol. You could try a steroid injection where we put cortisone into the joint. We have lubricant shots. You've heard about the gel shots, two parts and Synvis, just to name a few. And then sometimes arthroscopy helps. Now, arthroscopy, of course, is surgery where you look inside with a little pencil-sized telescope and you can smooth out areas that are rough or trim out what is torn. Next slide. So what is a joint replacement? And I don't think my pointer is working, uh, unfortunately. So... Um, but in a joint replacement, on the left side of this picture, you can see a, uh, a damaged knee. A knee is perfect, normally perfectly smooth, kind of like a cue ball. And in arthritis, it gets rough, more like sandpaper. And then on the image on the right side, you see a knee where we, where we have capped the ends of the bone with metal and plastic. And that's what's done in a replacement. We replace the ends of the bone with metal, plastic, or ceramic. Next slide. So uh, this video shows a, uh, a, uh, a, 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 the ligaments of a knee and how critical the ligaments are in a knee. We all know that between the medial collaterals and the lateral collaterals and the anterior cruciates and the posterior cruciates. And this just reminds us of that. Next slide. So this, uh, these are three different x-rays. On the left, you show a pretty good looking knee. There's good joint space. The black between the two bones is the joint space, and that shows cartilage, and those two bones are not touching. With the x-ray in the middle, you can see the two bones are touching. That's what we would call bone on bone. And in the x-ray on the right, you can see that this patient has already had a knee replacement, 
And the space in the middle is made up by plastic and the plastic is invisible on the x-ray. So it shows up black on the x-ray. So we're gonna run here an animation, okay, of a, uh, of a uh, knee replacement. And Dr. Savino and I use the computer to do all of our uh, joint replacements, all of our knee replacements. And what the computer does is the computer hovers over the patient and it makes sure that the hip, knee, and ankle are all lined up at the end of the case. So if we know what they are at the beginning, we teach the computer what they are at the beginning and we know what the goal is at the end, then the computer makes sure that we cut the bones in such a way as to get the hip, knee, and ankle all lined up perfectly. Before computers, when you do it manually, up to a third of the knees were out of alignment by three degrees or more. And just like the tires on your car, if they're out of alignment, they wear out very, very quickly. Well, with computers giving us the alignment precisely, we put a knee in that is designed to last a lifetime. Here we're stretching out the ligaments and we're measuring the ligaments because you want your knee to be well balanced. You want to be able to get it fully straight and you want to be able to get it flexed. The national average is 110 degrees, but many of our knees flex well above 110 degrees. We've already cut the tibia in this example, and now we're cut, coming in to cut the thigh bone or the femur. And the first thing we'll do is we'll cut the ends off the thigh bone, and then we'll come in with this miter box, if you will, and we'll make four more cuts at the end of the femur. And a total of five cuts will round the end of the femur and allow it to accept a rounded implant. So we'll come in here with our saw and we'll make the anterior, posterior, posterior chamfer and anterior chamfer cuts. Then we'll do a trial reduction. We'll take a femur and we'll tap down on in place and we'll put a tibia in place and we'll check the alignment and make sure that we are happy with these components. These are practice components, if you will. We haven't opened the real ones yet. And then if we like what we, what we have, we'll come in with the real components and we'll either press them in place or we will glue them in place to give you a solid knee that gets all the way straight and bends to 110, 120, sometimes 130 degrees. <clears throat> and that's the goal. Next slide. So this is somebody who's had a, uh, had a knee replacement. This flexion on the picture on the right, that's more than most people get, but some people do get that. And we do this through about a four and a half or five inch incision. Gone are the days where you see that your, maybe some of your friends have uh, one foot incisions. Those days are gone. Next slide. This is somebody who had a partial knee replacement. So they have arthritis on the medial side, which is the left side of this x-ray. And it's just on that one side. So we can go in there and just replace the knee on one side, one part of the knee joint. Next slide. We do that with this motorized uh, robot, if you will. This tool only allows us to take bone away from um, uh, where the computer believes we should remove bone. And if we stray from that, even a millimeter, it retracts this burr so that you can't take bone away. And this is a robotic assisted uh, surgery that we use to cut the bone precisely. Next slide. Talk a little bit about the hip joint. So the, the, the thigh bone or the femur is the bone on the bottom. The femoral head is the ball. And then you have the cup which is the socket, and that's in your pelvis, and the socket is called the acetabulum. Next slide. So this x-ray on the top left shows a good looking joint. There's good space between the ball and the socket. And then the x-ray to the right of that, you can see the bo two bones are touching. There's bone on bone, at least on the hip that's on the left side of the picture. And then in the bottom picture, you see this patient's had two different types of hip replacements. The one on the left side of the picture is a standard hip replacement. And the one on the right side of the picture is a hip resurfacing where you just cap the ends of the bone. And those have kind of gone out of favor now. Those are metal on metal and most of the people aren't doing those anymore. Next slide. 
I'm going to show you another animation. This one shows the hip replacement from the front. We go down and we spread the skin. We spread the muscles. Underneath that, we'll find some fat usually. We can open up that fat with the cordery. We'll pull these muscles to the side. Behind the muscles, we might find a vein or two. And we'll just seal those or, or cauterize those so they don't bleed. And then we can go past them. Then we come down to the capsule, which is these group of ligaments that hold the fluid around the joint. We'll open up that capsule and then we will put these retractors around and we will cut the ball off the top of the femur. Once we do that, we will pull that ball out and we will come in with these ice cream cone style reamers, these round burrs, if you will, and they'll spin in your hip and then we'll put a cup in and into that cup, we may or may not add a screw and then we'll put in a plastic liner our next step is then to worry about the femur. And the femur is hollow in the middle. That's where your bone marrow is. And we will go down there with this stem and we will put this stem in, clear, clear out the bone marrow. And we'll keep going with different sizes until we get one that fits just right. And when we get the one that fits just right, again, we'll do a trial reduction. We'll come in with these plastic balls and we will, they come different lengths and we will adjust the length of your hip and we'll do a trial reduction like this. Then when that's done, we'll finally put the final one in, which will be either a metal ball or a ceramic ball. And then we're ready to close, close the skin and go home. Next page, uh, next slide. <laughs> so um, the advantage of doing it from the back, it's most common. There is a chance of injuring the sciatic nerve and dislocations are rare. There is a lot of talk about going from the front. Going from the front is definitely, it's harder to do. It takes some special training. It's almost impossible to dislocate when you go from the front, but it's not for everybody. I won't do uh, uh, severely overweight patients from the front. Um, big muscular males are harder to do from the front. So I will only do it for, for certain patients. And there are pros and cons to going from the back or going from the front. I will tell you about 95% of the ones in this country are done from the back, uh, but going from the front is the latest craze. And that's something you're gonna wanna talk to your surgeon about. There was always a chance when you go from the front of injury to the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. This is a nerve kind of where your, your front pocket is in your pants. This nerve does not go to any muscle, does not go to, it doesn't have anything to do with movement. It just goes to the skin. And there's always a chance of injuring that nerve. And when all is said and done, it's probably about 5%. There's probably about a 5% chance that you could have some numbness. And it's never a disability, but patients need to know about it ahead of time. Next slide. What about minimally invasive surgery? Yes, Dr. Savino and myself, we do that where we go through the smaller incisions. We believe the rehab is faster, that there's less bleeding, that it looks better. The muscles are stronger, it's faster to close, and you get out of the hospital faster or even the same day. Next slide. Now I'm gonna pass this off to Dr. Savino, who's gonna to talk to you about the long-term risk and the goals. Thanks, Mike. Next slide. Um, so one of the things that everybody wants to know about, I'm Rick Savino, by the way. Um, Dr. Fracky and I have been on Long Island Bone and Joint for a long time and <clears throat> matter. Um, physicians for quite a, quite a while, over almost 20 years. So uh, one thing that everybody wants to know is about activity and uh, we want patients, how long are they gonna be down is the most common question. Uh, and hopefully you're not gonna be down at all. Most of our patients are up walking uh, either in the recovery room or shortly thereafter and are moving uh, very quickly. I'll show you a video later of patients uh, all within 24 hours of surgery walking uh, exercise is a critical component of your home care, uh, particularly during the first few weeks. So we want you up and moving right away and resuming your activities of daily living within three to six weeks. Exercise is very, very important to strengthen your knee and hip. A knee um, replacement is a audience participation event. If you don't do the therapy, if you don't work hard at it, uh, you generally will not get a good result. We'll talk about that more as time goes on. But sitting, standing, climbing stairs is usually allowed right away and not restricted at all. 
Next slide. Stu, next slide, yep. So sports, um, most patients can return to their favorite activities like golf, tennis, and cycling. As far as restrictions to sports, uh, we're not excited about our patients doing high impact activities like basketball or running marathons. These are metal and plastic uh, and they can wear. So heavy duty impact is generally not recommended. That having been said, we do have patients that do do high impact activities. Um, so in general, you can pretty much do what you want, but you have to understand that you may wear this out or loosen it. And we'll talk about that as time goes on as well. Next slide. So um, like Dr. Fracchi has said, some of these uh, knee replacements now are being done as an outpatient. Um, so you can go home essentially the same day um, with outpatient physical therapy. Those are the superstars, patients that uh, are ready to go to outpatient right away. Uh, most patients go home with home care, visiting nurse and in-home physical therapy. Most patients at this point are staying overnight in the hospital. Um, although, like I said, we do have a fair amount of patients that are going home the same day. Um, and then some patients who have very little help at home or very debilitated or more elderly patients um, do have the option of going to a subacute rehab. We have the TCU at a matter um, and uh, depending on their needs for more intense physical therapy. Next slide. We also want you to have realistic expectations about joint replacement surgery. More than 95% of patients generally have greatly reduced pain. Uh, most have increased function, increased activities of daily living and improved quality of life. There are some patients that do have issues with the front of their knee and kneeling uh, and some pain in the front of their knee, but in general, the vast majority um, have very, very reduced pain and are very happy one of the more satisfying surgeries that we do. Next slide. What are some of the potential risks? Um, some of the potential risks for both knee and hip are infection. That's the one that we really get very concerned about. Um, we wear special suits. We will operate in special rooms. Um, and we're very, very careful uh, with our patients, making sure that um, they have no active infections to reduce that and matters. Infection numbers are very, very good. And I uh, encourage you to go on the CMS website and look at matters numbers. They compare pretty much to anybody's nerve injury. Um, as Dr. Fracchia spoke about with the hips, much more um, of an issue or a concern during hips, very low, but uh, knees very rare, loosening blood loss, laxity, stiffness, fracture, <clears throat> and DVT, which is a deep venous thrombosis, a blood clot in the leg, or a PE where that breaks off and goes to the lungs, pulmonary embolus, very concerning as well. But again, by getting patients up and moving, next slide, uh, we can ensure to minimize that as much as possible. Uh, all patients get anticoagulated, at least with aspirin, um, and uh, that's usually twice a day, four weeks for hips and usually two weeks for knees. How can you prevent these uh, risk factors? If you're overweight, uh, lose weight, uh, this will help reduce the pressure on the joints and reduce your pain. Weight is now a very big issue um, because we know that um, if you have a body mass index and you can Google body mass index, it's basically your height and weight and it tells you your body mass index, but if your body mass index is over 40, in general, your risk of major complication goes up 10 times. And there are some insurance companies, namely workers' compensation now, that if your body mass index is over 35, they will not approve a joint replacement. So we're finding out now, you know, as time goes on, that weight has a big issue or it has a big component of how well joint replacements do. Um, and that goes hand in hand with diabetes. If you have uh, diabetes, we want you to follow your diet, check your blood sugars, and make sure you're taking your medications because if your hemoglobin A1C is over eight or eight and a half, most times 
we will recommend that that get be lowered before surgery. And if, you're, um, if your blood glucose is too high on the day of surgery, your surgery may be canceled. Also smoking, we'd like you to stop period, but at least three to five days before surgery decreases your chance of lung problems and speeds your recovery. Next slide. So things we want you to know, uh, we used to give a um, card or a prescription uh, for patients with hip or knee replacements for the airport. Uh, TSA no longer cares about that. Um, your hip or knee will set off metal detectors. So if you have the chance to go through a scanner, um, you certainly can do that. We want you to let it, your dentist know and your gastroenterologist know that you've had a joint replacement because you should be given oral antibiotics about an hour before all dental procedures, including cleanings and GI procedures, colonoscopies for the rest of your life. Um, we want you to see uh, your orthopedic surgeon periodically for routine x-rays uh, because we can see on x-ray that clear space that Dr. Fracky spoke about. Uh, as that gets more narrow, sometimes we can swap out a piece of plastic, which is a much easier operation than taking out everything if the metal hits the metal. That having been said, your joint replacement is designed to last a lifetime, and the vast majority of patients will not have to have a revision if it's done in a timely fashion. So this is the video I was talking about. All these, This is down in Ecuador. All these patients are within 24 hours of surgery. Um, and uh, this is a 150 foot walk that they did. Uh, it's a little glitchy. I think uh, we're having an issue with our, um, with our internet here, um, but you're seeing this gentleman here on the right who's less than one day out from surgery already walking with just a cane uh, in a 95 degree hallway here in Ecuador. Dr. Fracchi and I have both had the opportunity to do multiple missions um, medical missions where we uh, do uh, joint replacements. These last two women had surgery a couple of hours before this little race that the physical therapist put together. Uh, and you see here, uh, they're up and walking and doing their thing. This gentleman loses his cane. So uh, one day out from surgery, feels confident enough to walk without a cane. Um, and uh, although it did slow him down, and you can see a lady on his right there is, is trying to pass him on the right. Um, so this doesn't happen in the States. We don't have these sort of races. Uh, a physical therapist would probably lose his job if you tried to do that in the hospital. Um, but it's just to show you what's possible. Uh, and, uh, you know, the days of staying in the hospital for two or three weeks and laying in bed for a few days are long gone. Next slide. Um, so I think we're going to turn it on over to Alan here. He's going to do the, uh, Jay, you're going to do the um, pre-surgical? Hi, good, e good evening. My name is Jay. I'm the nurse practitioner over here at Mather Hospital. So we'll talk a little bit about pre-surgical testing. So basically pr prior to your surgery, 30 days prior, uh, you may need, you need to go to pre-surgical testing. So the visit, allocate two hours prior to the visit. I mean, during the visit. So this is where they do your medical tests. No swab, chest x-rays, and your medical surgical history will be reviewed. And as well as they'll review your list of medication, as well as supplementations that you are taking. And after this, two days prior to your surgery, you need to return so that they could do your COVID testing. Next slide. So as Dr. Savino was saying, we do have a state-of-the-art operating suite. It's, it's constructed for, uh, for, for total joints especially, and you do have high definition monitors and as well as uh, high intensity and low heat surgical lights and an air filtration to protect you. So it cycles, it exceeds the cycle uh, requirement for air exchange per hour. So uh, also they do wear space suits, as Dr. Savino was saying earlier, this is to protect you from getting infection. So during that time, you'll need to ambulate to the OR and of course, additional introductions will be performed who's gonna be in surgery. So anesthesia will be administered and multiple patient safety measures will be carried out. Next slide. So 
After that, you'll be going to the orthopedic nursing unit, which is a dedicated unit, and you do have staff that are trained in total joint replacement care. So there will be an ongoing assessment neurovascularly and to keep an eye to prevent complications. Pain medications will be given and all these will be coordinated with physical therapy, occupational therapists, as well as nursing and ourselves. Next slide. Oh, anesthesia. I'll turn. Yeah, we have uh, Tom Catone uh, from Anesthesia, one of our board certified anesthesiologists. He'll take us through that, Tommy. Yeah, I, yeah I, thanks for having us. Um, so when, when we meet you on the day of surgery, um, you are. Oh, yeah, that's really Tom Catone. I know it says Jeffrey Rubenstein, but it's really <laughs> Tom Catone. Yeah, Jeff Rubenstein is one of our partners and another anesthesiologist, and I'm using his login right now. So, uh, so, um, uh, so when, when you meet us on the day of, uh, on the day of surgery, um, uh, you're really well prepared um, uh, uh, from, from a medical standpoint because of the excellent work that's been done by Dr. Sfracchi and Dr. Savino and their offices, as well as um, pre-surgical testing, making sure that everything is just perfect um, as, you're, as you're walking into the operating room ready for surgery. So, um, but, but on that day, you meet us. Uh, and we go through all the all the pre-surgical testing, uh, and and make sure and and just re, you know confirm one more time that all is good. We go through your history, and and um, and then we review your history with you and and go through the uh, the anesthetic choices, um, uh, and that's you know typically a uh, a, um, a spinal and and uh, as well as a, a nerve block to help out with uh, for the total knees a, a nerve block to help out with uh, post-operative pain management. So the whole idea in, in the total joint uh, protocol here is to really reduce narcotics. Um, and, uh, and we do that through a multimodal um, uh, plan uh, using a number of different non-narcotic medications as well as nerve blocks and the spinal as well. Uh, so so with, with that multimodal technique, um, we can reduce the use of, of narcotics as well as reduce um, post-op nausea and vomiting. Uh, and, and of course, you know, ha have you... Uh, awake and alert and moving around very quickly afterwards. Yeah, the next slide, please. Whoop, ooh. Uh, <laughs> so um, so when we get into the operating room, we'll, we'll, we'll bring you inside. We'll give you a couple cocktails, make you, you will certainly be the happiest person in the operating room, very comfortable and, 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 and you know, just very comfortable with, with what's going on because of, uh, of, of how, uh, how everything is all set up. Uh, and we can either give you a general anesthetic, which sometimes we do. Um, more typically, it's a spinal anesthetic where it's, uh, you know, after you get a little sedation, you have a, 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 a spinal, which is pretty much a shot in the back that makes you numb from the waist down. And, um, and then we'll give you some more sedation while, while, you, while you're there as well. And, and you'll just be, you know, snoring away pretty much the whole time. Um, for post-operative pain management, uh, um, for, for the total knees, we can do something called an adductor canal block. And that's um, that's that's blocking the nerves that go down to your knee, and that'll and that'll last a good day or so, and make you a lot more comfortable after surgery as well. And for the total hips, you'll you'll wake up um, comfortably as well uh, through all the um, other medications. Again, mostly non-narcotic medications uh, that we'd be giving you as as well. And the spinal uh, would make you a lot more comfortable when you wake up. And of course, there's always a choice of uh, patient-controlled analgesia, which is like a morphine pump. Um, rarely used, but but if we need to, we'll use that as well, just to make sure that you're you know extremely comfortable. All right, and again, post after the surgery, um, you'll be awake right after the surgery as we're finishing up putting the bandages on, and uh, and and we'll end up in the recovery room or the post anesthesia care unit. Uh, you'll be there for a little while. Anesthesiologists are are there. Um, very competent. Uh, um, Registered nurses are there who, who are you know, who are in the recovery room all the time and, and know exactly how to take care of patients just like you. And then shortly thereafter, you'd head up to the uh, to the to the floors where where many other patients just like you will be at as well. Okay, so hi, I'm Jennifer. I'm the orthopedic coordinator. Um, so afterwards, physical therapy will see you and they're going to prepare you for a safe discharge. 
They're going to move you independently from laying down to a standing position. They teach you how to get in and out of bed, how to walk independently, household distances, not just a few feet that started the day of surgery, and to safely perform all your exercises, follow movement precautions safely and effectively, and how to, they teach you how to negotiate stairs safely. Next slide. So you will also be seen by the occupational therapist. They prepare you for a safe transition to their discharge setting. Um, they help patients perform their everyday activities independently. So with hips, they teach you how to put on shoes, how to, how to get dressed. Um, they educate patients self-care techniques, mobility and safe transfers, necessary equipment that you may need, and even safety in the home. Next slide. Go ahead. So the social worker will see you the day of surgery and depending on your physical and clinical status, you'll be discharged one to two days after surgery. Your progress and readiness for discharge will be assessed daily by your physician and the interdisciplinary team. Your medical social worker will visit you the day after surgery. They develop a plan, a personalized discharge plan. They help you with any insurance questions and they make all the discharge arrangements. Once you are discharged, your physical therapy will continue based on your physician and your physical therapist recommendations and insurance authorizations. You may be discharged to home and have either home physical therapy or you can do outpatient physical therapy and they will give you durable medical equipment if you need a walker. About 80% of our patients do go home with one version of physical therapy. There is also the Mather Hospital Transitional Care Unit if you need a little more rehab or for those people that are physically deconditioned, not doing as well, they can go to a subacute rehab center. So home safety, you want to make your home safe before surgery. You want to move any throw rugs, grip surfaces in the shower and tub. You certainly don't want to slide. You wear shoes with good support with non-slip soles. So you're going to set up, you want to keep items within reach throughout the house so you're not bending and reaching. Grab bars if you need them. So we also have a team that will verify your insurance and eligibility benefits before surgery. Your physician will be contacted if pre-authorization is required and you'll be notified if there is a copay. The hospital will be billing your insurance for all of the services it provides, and the charge will include room and board, the cost of the implants, the services of the hospital staff, the physical therapy, the lab, the respiratory, the nurses, and the use of hospital equipment. You will get a walker to use while you're here. Typically, if you have Medicare, there is a yearly deductible every time you are 60 days hospital free. So the deductible for 2021 is $1,484. If you have a secondary insurance carrier, we will bill them for that deductible. Mather Hospital does participate in all the major managed care companies, which include Aetna, Cigna, Blue Cross, GHI, Oxford, and United. The patient responsibility really does vary according to the plan and by the cardholder. There's so many different plans out there. Generally speaking, a copay can run anywhere from $25 to $1,500. Before you come in for surgery, we will let you know what your copay is for the surgery. As with any surgery, there are additional providers who will charge a fee for their professional services. Anesthesia, in addition to your surgeon's bill, it's possible to get additional bills from an assistant surgeon, a radiologist, a pathologist, a hospitalist, or medical doctor in the hospital. 
and anesthesiologist or other healthcare providers who assist with your care. Most of these providers participate with your insurance. The insurance verification team can be reached at this number, it's 631-686-7907, and they can estimate your out-of-pocket amounts before you ever have surgery. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Jen. So, and I encourage everyone to do that. If you call that number, they'll be happy to tell you what it would cost you if you came to Mather for your uh, joint replacement. We are required to tell everyone that we are a CCJR hospital. Every hospital in the tri-state area is a CCJR hospital. Medicare is terrified because right now there's 900,000 joint replacements done in the United States every year. And that number is expected to go up almost fourfold in the next nine years. It's going over 3 million in the next nine years. And Medicare is trying to figure out how we're going to pay for that. So one way they did that is under this CCJR, Comprehensive Care for Joint Replacements. And Medicare, in a sense, budgets about $30,000 for your joint replacement. And of that $30,000, Mather gets half, roughly $15,000. And out of that, they have to pay for the, the, the implant that goes in. And that's anywhere from four to $5,000. Then they have to pay the nurses, the rent, the mortgage, the taxes, the insurance, all the medications, all the other expenses room, board, everything else that happens over your time at the hospital. The second half of Medicare budget goes to pay all the doctors who saw you and anything else you need for the next 90 days. Home care, if you go to a skilled nursing facility, if therapy comes to your house, everything that you need for the next 90 days, even if you go off and have a heart attack, okay, that's all in that next 90 days. And if it comes in under 30,000, then Mather gets a bonus. And if it comes in over 30,000, Mather has to pay Medicare back money. This is not an option, this is the law. It doesn't affect you directly. In other words, it doesn't change what you pay. It changes the relationship between Mather and Medicare. And that's true for every hospital in the tri-state area. And we're required to tell you that this is going on. So you can't avoid it, it's just the law of the land and it's been this way now for six years. And with that, I thank you all for attending and I turn it back over to Stu. Hey, thank you, Dr. Frackia, Dr. Savino, all our presenters for your extremely informative presentation. Uh, if anyone has any questions that they didn't get a chance to ask or if you think of a question later, you could email it to us at Mather Hospital, one word, Mather Hospital at northwell.edu, and we will pass it on to one of our presenters to respond. As Dr. Fracky has said, you'll see on exiting the webinar, a link will pop up to complete a survey. It's very short and your feedback is extremely important to us. Thank you again for attending Mather Hospital's knee and hip replacement webinar and have a good evening.